ओके हेलो एवरीवन वेलकम टू द आवर न्यू सेशन ऑफ क्लोजर ऑन स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी वेबिनार and i think this is the last session of the first semester of the 2024 my name is uh, yi pen as probably many of you already know uh i'm from uh global soil partnership uh, food and agriculture organization of the united nation i coordinate uh, activities related to soil spectroscopy as uh, probably you know the main objective for, of uh, the closer on spec uh, initiative is uh, strengthen the capacity and uh, try to do the capacity development uh, through the different approaches and uh, this webinar is one of the uh, main approaches to uh, for our capacity development uh, objective um today uh i'm glad uh, our webinar will move to africa kenya narobi kenya i if i'm correct if i'm correct i think uh, this is the first time i bring, we bring our webinar to the african continent and i'm so glad to have the support from uh, colleagues uh, from ecraf uh, agro world agro forest please correct me if i Say the full name Raj. Um, and the, today's webinar, we will have uh, three speakers, renowned speakers, to share their experience and knowledges uh, in relation to the regarding to the soil the laboratory of the soil spectroscopy, also the data management, uh, data analysis, also related to the. Uh, so spectroscopy measurement protocol and the lab management, etc. Uh, as probably some of uh, you already know, the ECRAF is uh, one of the earliest uh, soil spectroscopy lab in our community. They have decades of the experience and the knowledge on the development of the soil spectroscopy, also the establishment of the soil spectroscopy labs. Uh, so I, before I introduce our um, speakers, and I would like to um, say a little small rules about this uh, webinar. So this webinar will be conducted in a Zoom platform, and participants, you will not be able to turn on your microphone on a camera. If you have any questions regarding to the webinar, or if you have any would like to have any any discussions would like to discuss with our speakers please raise your question in a QA session and our speakers will be happy to respond to your question by typing or later on i will bring these questions to the discussion session and uh, so hopefully our discussion will reach our uh, webinar and uh, also our webinar will be recorded so later on uh, I be, because it's it will be always the issue in terms of the time schedule and uh, we cannot cover the entire of the world mm, for example like now it will be very late for the colleagues from new zealand and australia so the recording will be uploaded to our web page later on and also the presentation the slides will be uploaded to the website the, as um, free resources for the colleagues to watch later. Um, also, um, so this uh, webinar, uh, we, as I mentioned, this webinar will be supported by three speakers. So I would like to introduce these three speakers. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Fampela Pitaki. And uh, she has some, um, a uh, PhD degree in soil science, has specialized in uh, soil spectroscopy, has uh, many years uh, experience and knowledge for data anal uh, data analysis, the spectral information, especially for the modeling and uh, calibration, validation, uncertainty, assessment, etc. So later on, you will be hearing this from, from her. And then we will have uh, two gen honorable gentlemen, uh, Mr. Dickens Ateku 
and uh, Elvis. Ooh, uh, both of them have a long experience uh, in uh, lab management and uh, measurement uh, protocol and also the training for the spectroscopy uh, measurement also instrument maintenance. So those experience, uh, what they are going to share in later on, it's the experience and knowledge from the decades of the, their learning in uh, ECRAF. So without further ado, and I would like to pass the floor to our first speaker today, Dr. Zambella Pitaki, the floor is yours, please. So thank you, Dr. Peng. Actually, first of all, I would like to thank you on behalf of the whole team um, for inviting us on this uh, webinar in the Global uh, Soil Lab Network. Today, the presentation will be unlocking the science of soil and plant diagnostic at C4E Craft State of the Art Laboratory. So, as all of us here today, 95% of our food is produced directly or indirectly from soils. So sustainable soil management can boost food production by up to 58%. Healthy soil is the ability of the soil to sustain the productivity, diversity, and environmental services of terrestrial ecosystems. So a healthy soil can be defined as well as a dynamic ecosystem that performs a variety of essential functions such as controlling plant disease, nutrient cycling, improving soil function with positive effects for filtering and storing water and nutrient capacity and contribute to improving crop production. And also it helps to mitigate the climate change by maintaining or increasing its carbon content. And of course, healthy soil is very crucial for achieving several SDGs. Few examples is a zero hunger, good health and well-being, and there are so other many. Unfortunately, over the 25% of the Earth's surface is degraded, and this is impacting over 3.2 billion people. And the most widespread form of degradation is the soil erosion. So maintaining the status quo is not viable anymore. We urgently require targeted investments in landscape restoration, beginning with soil. These investments must be prioritized, tracked, and focused on the needs of farmers. As you can see here in the picture, landscapes are diverse. What that means, this requires a sampling design to capture this variability. Soil analysis technologies that of course are cost-effective and robust. Data analytics that can assess the complex drivers of degradation and frameworks that can track changes over time. Therefore, information on spatial variability of key soil properties is essential for prioritizing and tracking land management interventions from the small scale farm level to the global landscape level. In our theme, there are four main objectives. In order to address pressing global challenges, broken food systems, environmental degradation, accelerating climate change and biodiversity loss. The first one is the science where soil and land health monitoring over time, including soil organic carbon accounting for climate change mitigation and adaptation. The second one is policy in order to contribute to and inform national and global agendas regarding the ecosystem restoration, food system transformation, and soil health based on state of the art science. The third one is innovation. And here is actually where the lab of the soil spectroscopy uh, lab is coming in mostly regarding the advanced development, application and scaling of soil and land health assessments using soil spectroscopy, soil biology, remote sensing, machine learning. And finally, 
The fourth one is the scaling, investing in learning to scale healthy solid practices and track changes over time, including opportunities to integrate soil health into policies. Our theme currently is contributing to 30 projects and leading 14 projects from 16 donors. And here you can see the map. Now, in order to understand the multiple dimensions of soil health for ecosystem restoration, climate change, and food and nutrition security, the scientists at c 4 craft they have developed the land degradation surveillance framework. We call it LDSF. And actually, this is an application of a systematic sampling framework. It uses innovative methods for soil analysis and of course, it's coupled with statistical analysis to generate predictive maps. There are several indicators that it measured through this uh, protocol. We have the vegetation cover, the land degradation, the soil hyd hydrology, land management, and soil health variables. And we measure all these wonderful key indicators. So here you can see a map where we we have currently um, performed LDSF is data driven network of the LDSF site. Each um, site is 100 square kilometer with 160 sampling plots. And actually, for the last 23 years, we're sampling. The point here that I want to mention is to be systematic. And um, we measure all the previous information, as I mentioned, regarding the soil and land health. This network, this network is growing and specifically is 20 sites per year. But the question, what makes the DSF uniquely valuable? Consistently applied across landscape and context is a low technology equipment. It follows a hierarchical hierarchical sampling design, and is enabled by advancements in soil spectroscopy. And of course, multiple indicators of soil and land health measured at georeference locations. So here you can see how the structure is of the LTSF. We have the sampling plots, then divided to a square of 10 kilometers and are selected at random across a region, or they may represent areas of plant activities. Each side now is divided into 16 tiles, is a middle picture actually, of 2.5 by 2.5 um, kilometer each. Within each tile, random centroid location are generated for clusters of one square kilometer. And each cluster center point, the sampling points are randomized. And it consists, if you can see the last picture of four subplots. And then from the through the pictures, you can see briefly, we capture a lot of the spatial variability in landscape. And the action actually is at plot scale where we do sampling at the plot and subplot. So this is unbiased sampling. As I mentioned before, the soil samples are taken from each subplot, four of them, and composite at the plot level at two depths. So we have the topsoil that is from zero to 20 centimeter depth and 160 subsoils that we sample from 20 to 50 centimeter per site. So all samples are analyzing using mid infrared spectroscopy. We send out for reference soil samples analysis using wet chemistry for pH, organic carbon, and total nitrogen using the dry combustion method, base cations, texture, etc. Predictions are made using the spectrum, the wet chemistry data, and we split 70% for calibration model and 30% for validation models. And this landscape scale sampling is, of course, enabled by soil spectroscopy. At C4 ECRAF, we invest 
in advanced spectral analytics. And here you can see the latest um, instruments that we have, the Brooker in Vinio, FTMIR, and the Alpha 2 z and FTMIR. So what we do, there is a phrase that we love, shining a light on soil, plants, food, and input. So the innovation here is to advance the development application and scaling of soil spectroscopy. Sometimes we couple it with remote sensing, machine learning for rapid and accurate assessment of soil health at scale. So we're leading global lab for accurate, cost-efficient, and rapid analysis of soil, plants, and inputs using spectroscopy. Our lab is gold standard lab for FAO in Glossoland, and actually we're analyzing 20,000 soil samples annually. And over 200,000 georeference samples barcoded in our physical archive. So here is just an example that 30 countries, we have 30 countries, the sample size is 15,000 samples with reference samples. We develop deep learning uh, models with R square over 0 0.9. And then I will let my colleague Dickens to continue. You are muted, Dickens. Thank you, Zampella. I'll proceed from where Zampella has left. Usually, once we samples come from the field, we usually receive them in our lab. And uh, as a lab, we've got like uh, three roles. One of our role is, of course, sample analysis. Our second role is on innovation, where we develop different analytical methods and work for processes to be used on different work session during lab analysis. And our third role is on capacity building, where we now train our different partners on the different methods and lab workflow processes that we've developed. Uh, of course, we know with, infra, with, with, with soil spectroscopy, it has given us an advantage in that it's rapid, cost effective with high throughput. This has given us an opportunity whereby now we are in a position to sample, to have intense sampling on huge landscape, analyze those samples within a very short time and quite cheaply. Because of this, it's really critical for us to have good and robust workflow processes that will ensure that the kind of data we are generating from this huge lot of sample is quality data. And uh, therefore, as ECRAF, what we've done, we've developed workflow processes all the way from the field during sample collection to the lab during sample analysis and processing measurements, all the way to how we, we do data processing and reporting. My colleague Zampella had already mentioned that we use the LDSF protocol when we are doing soil sampling on the field. Once we receive the samples, the samples are usually kept on the drying room for them to dry before we proceed with sample processing. Sample labeling is usually critical when you are on the field because this is the information that is going to be uploaded on our different uh, workflow processes. Next. So, we usually handle about 20,000 samples every year as a lab. And uh, from experience during handling these samples, two critical things could go wrong. And we really need to maintain the integrity of these samples. What could go wrong is one, you can very easily have sample mix up because you're handling very many samples at the same time. Two, we really need to avoid cross contamination of the samples because you know in dry spectroscopy where we are, we are going to introduce very 
minimal amount of samples to the spectrometer instrument. So it's really very critical to ensure that the environment held by you are doing all these processes is dust-free to avoid sample uh, cross-contamination and sample mixer. For us to do this, we've developed workflow processes that we've put down in place. We've got different workflow processes ranging from what I'm, say, I'm showing on the screen, the workflow process for sample reception workflow, whereby it's showing how we receive the samples and all the steps that these samples are going to go through all the way from uh, sample preparation, subsampling, milling, and presenting the samples ready for analysis. What happens on this, our workflows is that on each and every different workstation, we've got standard operating procedures that shows the technicians who are working on that particular station how to do the process of that particular station. At the same time, we've got quality control checks on each of these work stations. What that does is ensures that we are in a position whereby we are able to monitor the whole process of how sample is handled right from the field into the lab, into how it's analyzed all the way to how, how we do the data generation and reporting. We don't only have workflow processes on our sample reception. On the different labs, we also have the same workflow processes that are showing the different protocols that are supposed to be followed. Now, usually what happens with these workflow processes uh, is that uh, as a lab, you are supposed to strive to continuously improve your workflow processes. For example, in our case, what we usually do is that uh, we usually welcome feedback from the, our technicians who are using these workflow processes so that we're able to see where we can adjust the workflow processes so that they can become more efficient. Uh, we also do have uh, what we call RC, uh, uh, root cause analysis reports. What these reports do, let's say, for example, if there's an incident in the lab that happened that compromised the quality of the work output on that particular workstation, we are going to, uh, to like do draft a root cause analysis report of what happened on that particular workstation. What this does, it enables us to rectify what happened so that it does not reoccur in future. In this way, you continuously improve your workflow processes to ensure that uh, sample handling is not compromised on any particular stage. Okay, next. Apart from the workflow processes, we also have a laboratory information management system, LIMS that also assist us in how we manage this huge number of samples that we receive in the lab. LIMS is an online, LIMS is an online access software developed in C4 aircraft that provides solutions for laboratory operations, including a structured workflow and support in data retrieval, data tracking and storage of all the samples that we receive. On the slide here, we have uh, the ECRAF, C4 ECRAF uh, LIMP system. This is just on the outlook whereby it's showing you the key performance indicators of our LIMPs. What you see here is that currently on our LIMPs, we've got data of samples that we received from 26 different countries across the region. The number of spectra that are currently uploaded in our LIMPs are about 250,000 spectra. And uh, the number of samples that we've archived on our limbs is about 160,000 samples. So you can see the way this limbs is quite robust. And of course, the instruments that it's supporting whereby the data is uploaded of the limbs are 30 instruments. On these instruments range from the dry spectroscopy instruments, that is the infrared instruments, to the X-ray fluorescence instruments, to instruments that are not of dry spectroscopy and we're also using in our lab. For example, uh, the instruments of the living science lab, like the microscopes and all that. Next. Some of the features of the LIMP system that we've developed is that it has got like uh, six key features. Uh, the first feature that I'm going to explain deeply as on other slides 
The first feature is sample submission. This is a feature whereby uh, what we are looking here is how it has sample, the sample price list and the analytical packages of what our lab offers. It also uh, has, uh, this is where we also uh, receive the samples, register the samples and do also assessing of the samples. Basically, I'm going to explain that into details as we go to that module. The second feature is a feature of a sample scheduling and monitoring of analysis. Basically, what this feature does, it's, it, it, it's, it does sample tracking at processing, preparation, analysis, and analysis workstations. So with this feature, we are able to monitor all the analysis that is happening on the lab, on the different workstations, and be able to know uh, if we are on course or we are delaying uh, on, on, on like uh, reporting that particular batch of samples. So this is the feature that is helping us to like manage all this huge number of samples that we are receiving. Another feature in LIMS that we have, it's called spectral data feature. Basically what happens is this in this feature, this is whereby we upload the spectral data that we are receiving from different instruments. They can be in form of binary files, but in our case, since we are using Bruca instruments, uh, the files are usually in form of Opus Lab files. This is where we normally upload uh, those uh, Opus files. At the same time, that feature will be storing those files as a CSV, whereby now if you want to use them in future, you can just download and process them for further uh, data processing. Another feature that we have, we call advanced instrumentation. This is where uh, all the state of art equipment that we have are, are, are linked to LIMS, where that, whereby uh, we are able to see all those instruments on LIMS. And uh, in case uh, any data is uploaded on any particular instrument, you can be able to monitor and know with what instrument is, is, uh, is lagging behind or what instrument is at par with what is supposed to be, do, uh, to be done. This helps us also to track uh, the number of instruments we have, the instruments that are operating, the instruments that are not operating, because it also uh, uh, helps us to like uh, archive or all the data for the previous instruments that we were, we were using and we are currently not using. All those are, are, are enabled by this feature called advanced instrumentation. Another feature that we have that uh, we are also still currently developing, we are calling it spectral prediction. This feature is still not function, functional, but uh, it's under process. What we are envisaging on this feature to do, it's going to have data analytics based on the spectral library we've developed uh, to develop robust spectral calibration and validation models so that it can be able to give uh, key functional properties. And uh, finally, the last feature we have, we call it archive, whereby we do, uh, we do archive all the soil samples for curation. Most of the soil samples that we usually archive are soil samples that are of value to us. These samples mostly are the ones that we've collected using the LDSF protocol, so that we can be able like, to uh, retrieve the sample in future when you want to use, it, to use them more so when you're developing new methods of analysis or we want to like uh, go back to different particular studies. Next. Yeah, so now when you like uh, open the limbs, it's going to show you the dashboard. This is how the dashboard looks like. On the dashboard on the left side, you are seeing the different uh, icons, uh, the different menus that perform different tasks. For example, we have the sample submission that I've mentioned. We've got the jobs, we've got the scheduling, we've got data section, we've got sample archives, we've got invoicing, and we also have got uh, a menu whereby scientists can monitor their data. Let's say, for example, if you submitted your data for analysis, you can be able to monitor to see uh, the progress of, uh, the, of, of the analysis of your samples. Next. So this is the sample submission uh, sample submission menu. When you enter to the sample submission menu, what you are going to see, it's going to like uh, open to you this window that uh, enables you like to be able to 
collect all the important information for that particular scientist who is like submitting the samples or that client who is submitting the samples. Some of the critical information that you normally collect from the is, is for example, the name of the scientist, the email address, the project, the site, the region, the countries, the date that we have received the samples so that we can be able to put timestamps when like uh, scheduling the samples, the number of samples. Other features that are usually on this uh, sample submission is that we are also going to take the analysis that the scientists are, has requested. Once we've ticked all the analysis the scientists have requested, we are also going to like check the expected results and reports from those particular samples that have been submitted. The analysis that you've checked uh, to be analyzed is going to be linked onto the, it's going to be linked in the LIM system uh, with, the, the in, with the invoicing bit, so that at the end of the analysis, uh, the LIMS is going to generate the total cost of the analysis for, to be invoiced. And uh, another feature is that uh, once we've ticked all the samples that all, all the analytic, all the analysis that you want to be done on the samples and we submit that particular samples, immediately what LIMS will do, it will give that batch of samples a job number. That job number is what now you will be using to track the sample analysis of those batch of samples that have been submitted. Next. Yeah, this is just example, an example of now the different jobs that have been created by LIMS. Uh, usually uh, what happens when a job is created, LIMS gives uh, the job number, uh, in, the, the job number is indicated into, has got like three codes. The first code is ICR, just indicating that uh, the samples have been submitted here in our lab in ICRAF. The second uh, portion is the number, for example, uh, like uh, the, the last job is ICR 33. That's the job number that uh, the last request has received. And then finally, the year, like now it's 2024. For example, if, if uh, we receive a new batch of samples that now, they are going to be, uh, it's going to be given a job that is ICR 34, 2024. So it's, it's kind of like chronological. So we can know which samples came, which, which job is first and which job, job came, came, came last. With this, we are able to prioritize the job that have come in based on how, uh, based on their agency and the number of samples and the analysis requested. Yeah, that's the, important, that's the importance of like uh, the, the, each, each and every job we receive being given a job number. Another critical thing on this page whereby the jobs are, uh, whereby we, 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 have, we have the jobs is that immediately a sample is given, a, a batch of samples we've received have been given a job number. The lab manager has to approve that particular job number so that all the other staff will be able to access that particular job. Immediately that is done. Now, what will happen is that, uh, we usually advise uh, the client who is giving us the samples to accompany the samples with the sample list in an Excel. So that Excel, we are going to upload it on our LIMP system and each and every samples on that Excel is going to be given a job number. So, so uh, sorry, it's going to be given a lab ID. So what will happen is that we'll have a job number and all the samples on that particular job number will have lab IDs. So those lab IDs are linked to the sample information of that particular sample, that for, of that particular sample list that was shared with the scientist. This is how we keep track of all the samples that we've received in our laboratory, because we are going to use the lab ID that the LIMS has assigned each job number, each, each sample to like analyze the samples in our lab. Next. Yeah, this is just an example of a job uh, that, uh, that I mentioned. You can see this is job number ICR 31, 2024. The country is Madagascar. We have the name of the scientist. There were a total of 400 samples. The samples were received in uh, May 17th. 
and uh, the tests that were requested on the lab are listed as we are seen there. So this is just an example of a particular job. Next. So now, what will happen now is that once the jobs are already on the system, before the different uh, staff on different workstations start working on the samples, they have to be scheduled. So now uh, the lab manager has to schedule the jobs to be analyzed on each and every workstation based on what, based on the analysis that was requested by the client. What that means is that we have some, some jobs that are going to appear in all the stations and we have some jobs that will not appear in all the stations depending on the analysis that was requested by the client. But from the sample processing, all the jobs have to pass through sample processing station. So usually what happens is that uh, uh, each job is going to be given timestamps on how long it's going to be on each particular workstation. So that's what is done when you're scheduling a job. So for example, on this job, if it's for on a subsampling station, uh, the, the person who is scheduling will put the start date and the end date, and he will assign the staff or the technician who is going to handle the samples. And immediately you click on submit. The technician who has been assigned to analyze those samples is going to receive an email telling him that this particular job number has been scheduled for subsampling and the starting date is this and the, and the due date is this. So this helps us to kind of like uh, monitor the, pro the processes in the lab. So we're able to know the diff uh, if the samples are, it, it enables us to be able to monitor if a sample is uh, like uh, analyzed within the required time or if there are delays on each particular work workstation. And for example, if there are delays on each in a particular work session, the person who is, who is responsible like to work on that samples, those samples on that particular work station should be able to like give us an explanation as to what are the challenges and uh, that are like uh, making us have delays on that particular job. Next. Yeah, so now once, uh, the samples have been like uh, process, processed and they're now ready for analysis on different instruments. The technicians who are operating the different instruments will receive also uh, an email telling them that uh, the samples have been scheduled to be analyzed on that particular instrument. Our lean system has got over 30 different instruments, uh, but uh, I'll just like give you an example using the, uh, the infrared spectroscopy instruments because uh, that's where our focus is. But as you can see, uh, we have got uh, the alpha spectrometers, we've got the NPS spectrometers, we've got the invenues, we also have got uh, PXRF, we also have got uh, weight chemistry data that we usually upload, and uh, we also have got uh, other workstations for, of our living soils lab that looks at below ground biodiversity. But I'm going to focus on uh, infrared spectroscopy. Let's say, for example, we've analyzed the samples using our standard uh, operating procedures on the Invenio spectrometer, and we've generated good quality spectra. The next step now is that the quality spectra that have been generated on the instrument have to be uploaded on limbs. For them to be uploaded on limbs, the technician will just click on uh, on the in various uh, spectrometer so that it gives him, it gives him sort of the option of uploading the data. Next. So yeah, now this is an example of uh, the in venues. So now once the, once the technician has clicked on the in venues, he will see all the jobs that are supposed to be analyzed on in venues. Now, depending on the analysis that has been done, is going to click on that particular job and upload all the opus files or all the spectral data of that particular jobs into the limb system. And what happens when these spectral files are uploaded into the limb system, two things will happen. One, the opus files will be stored on the limb system and can be retrieved in future if need be. Two, the limbs is going to convert the 
spectral data into CSV files, into a CSV table, sorry. So that uh, in case uh, uh, our scientists now want to work on the data, they can just download the CSV table for data processing. Next. Yeah, this is just uh, what I was explaining. For example, if you've uploaded the Opus files successfully, now this is how it, uh, the limbs will look like. And uh, it's on your, on your left, you can see it's giving you two options. You can download this, the converted Opus uh, CS, uh, CSV table, or you can download the Opus files. So it is versatile and it gives you all those options depending on uh, what you want. Next. Yeah, so now uh, since we are handling uh, samples of the same client but from different machines, the name system usually gives us an overview that, that uh, gives uh, the person who is like harnessing all the reports uh, what to expect on each particular job. Because you find that for some jobs, the only report that will be, request, will be required is uh, the report for the spectral data. While if the job had some uh, more analysis requests, apart from the spectral data, you might also, for example, need a report for the weight chemistry data or for uh, samples that have been analyzed in our living cells. So this particular page just gives us uh, uh, the, the person who is like uh, harnessing all the data and overview of the types of reports to be uh, to be uh, expecting on different jobs. Next. Now, once upon completion of analysis, the next step is usually archiving the samples. One of the things that I forgot, I had forgotten to mention when we, are, when, when we are receiving your samples, we usually, on the LIM system, it has got three options that it will ask you. Once we've completed analysis, how should we handle your samples? The three options are one, return to sender. If you had selected that one, all the samples that we've received upon completion of analysis are going to be returned back to you at, to you at your own cost. Two, dispose. If you've, if you've checked on dispose, upon completion of analysis, we are going to, uh, re, uh, to hold on the sample for six months upon completion of analysis before we dispose the samples. And there's a protocol of disposing the samples. Before we start disposing the samples, once the six months has, uh, have elapsed, we will notify you as the scientist that uh, we are planning to dispose the samples. If you are okay with it, we'll go ahead and dispose the samples. If you have, you have, if you have no any objections, even, but if you have any objections, you will tell us why so that we, we see uh, if you are going to continue holding on, 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 onto the samples, but you are now going to charge a fee. And uh, if you had, Ticked uh, archive the samples. We are going to archive the samples. Uh, I have to mention that most of the samples that we are archiving are our samples that have been uh, sampled using the LDSF protocol. And uh, currently, we have about 150,000 cell samples that have been archived in the facility. All the archived samples are usually backcoded to, to assist in, in, in uh, as, uh, be able to assist us to be able to like uh, retrieve information uh, as pertaining to those particular samples. Uh, next. Yeah, so now this is the final bit of limbs. As I had mentioned, based on all this, uh, the analysis that was were done on a particular samples, once we've completed the analysis, the limb system is going to like, uh, combine all those analytical packages that you, you had requested, and it's going to give it a cost of on the invoice. And it, upon once you've paid the invoice, uh, the, the person who is in charge of invoicing is going to like complete that job, and it will appear in green, showing that analysis has been completed and the invoice has been paid. So basically, this is just uh, a workflow process of, of the limbs all the way from how we receive the samples until to how we build the samples. Yeah, next. 
Yeah, apart from the LIMS system, we also have a standard operating procedures, SOP, to ensure quality controls on the different workstations. These SOPs are also accompanied with like some tutorial videos that are online showing how uh, you can do different particular processes. For example, if it's a sample processing, like uh, the chart that we're showing here, we have also a video that shows the step-by-step -step, uh, on how you can go about doing that. We also have videos for the different workstations showing the same. So with this uh, SOP, what this does, it puts us in a place whereby uh, we can easily like uh, even train uh, different users online on how we like handle our samples. And uh, you can also like download our SOPs online. And if you have any question, you can, you can be able to ask. We are trying as much as possible to avail the different resources that we are using in our sample handling or, or our quality control workflow processes so that uh, we can improve on the efficiency. And as usual, we usually welcome feedbacks that can help us continue to improve our workflow processes to making them more efficient and robust. Uh, next. Uh, lastly, also is on loading. Remember I told you when it comes to spectroscopy, it's how you load your samples is also critical because it's you if you are handling very many samples, you can very easily have sample mismatch or mix up. And what that will do, it will, it will make uh, you like misrepresent the sample when you are like uh, analyzing it on the instrument. And that will go a long way when you are like doing data processing and uh, data analysis, you will, you will not be like uh, using the actual correct data when you are of, of that particular sample. So it's really critical for us to maintain a system that takes care of sample mix up. So in our case, what we've done is that we have recording sheets that we use when we are like loading samples on the, for, to be introduced on the different equipments or machines. At the same time, all our samples usually have barcodes, as you can see, whereby if you scan that barcode, it's going to give you information as pertaining to all to that samples on limbs. So usually what happens when, when you are loading a samples, you are going to you are going to download the log the sample information from limbs. We usually call our sample information login form. So when you are doing your loading, you're going to have a login form and the recording sheet hand in hand. So with those two and the protocols that you put in place on how you like load your samples that ensures that we avoid sample mix-up. Another thing that we've done is that <clears throat> on our recording sheets, we've also introduced QR codes because we did realize that if we are, we are, for, we are, we are analyzing, let's say 300 samples in a day for MPA and 600 samples in a day for the Invenios. If you are analyzing 300 samples in a day and you want to be keying in the the lab ID of the particular samples that you are analyzing, it's very easy for you to have typo errors or misrepresentation of that particular sample. So what we've done, we've introduced QR codes. So instead of keying in the lab ID, you just scan the QR code and it will and, and the, the, the lab ID of that particular sample will be appearing on the instrument. What this has done, it has removed all the errors that were coming or were attributed to typo errors. So it has uh, made the, the workflow more efficient when it comes to loading and like a sample analysis using the uh, different spectrometers that we have in our lab. And uh, that just summarizes uh, what uh, we have as on, on our workflow processes. Thank you. Elvis, you can uh, go on, on and explain the next slide. You are muted. Thank you very much, Dickens and Zampella. Yes, we have been doing this for the last 23 years. ICRAF has invested in scaling up the technology across the globe. And how we've been doing this is we've been nurturing um, uh, the network labs or the new upcoming labs right on the technology from based on laboratory setup 
uh, that are based on ECRAF SOPs. Uh, we do the instrument setup based on ECRAF methods that are totally different from any other uh, system or lab that you might come across. Mind you, ECRAF develops these methods from scratch. And we've built these instrument methods and test, validated them over time and proved that they work uh, across instrument and calibration can be transferred across instrument. So what we give our partner, our regional lab network is top-notch setup. And it's also, we also focus on training them on sample login, sample processing, sample handling in the laboratory. We do training on laboratory workflows and LIMS system training on data processing and, and analysis that are based on robust machine learning algorithms. We also train on sample archiving and disposal. So all, all, we've noted that consistent and harmonized instrument methods and standard operating procedures are key uh, for one to generate high quality spectral data outputs, which is paramount for any research work that we are actually investing on or undertaking at any instance. Next. Yeah, so from the table, you can see that we support a number of labs. In actual sense, more than 38 labs across the globe that run several of the instruments that had earlier been mentioned. So this runs across. And in Africa, you can see we are more inclined to African countries. Uh, in Africa, we have a network that cuts across West, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, Eastern Africa, Ethiopia, Kenya, Ma um, we have Madagascar, Southern Africa, Malawi, Nigeria in West Africa, and outside Africa, we have supported CSRO uh, in Australia, we have China, Yunnan uh, um, producing company, India, we have CIMIT and ISSS, ICA, um, Peru, we have IAP, we have Rothamson Institute, so literally taking the technology across the globe. And also this US um, National Soil Survey Center that we help support remotely. And lately, as of last week, we were in Sri Lanka doing the setup for the Department of Export Agriculture and setting up their spectral lab in Matali. Next. So for all this lab, we offer training right from sample preparation, sample login, sample preparation, sample analysis, data processing, data analysis, data management, data archiving, sample disposal and sample archiving. And holistically, we do this to nurture these labs so they can basically start off, have the baby walks, be nurtured and grow up into fully mature lab that can exist on their own. And we also assist them and provide them with advice on how to sustain and manage the lab and introduce business to business concept so they can run more efficiently and more effectively and be able to sustain themselves on a long term. So you can see on this chart a whole span of activities that we had from 2019 up to 2024. So we are actually looking forward uh, in 2024 working under Islamic Development Bank uh, uh, in setting up labs in uh, several West African countries. That is uh, the Soil Fertility and Mapping Project uh, in Senegal, Mali, Gambia, Guinea, Sierra Leone. We're also planning to do the same for our CARLO in Kenya um, under the NAV CDP project. At the same time, applying that to Ethiopia. So we always offer both physical and virtual training uh, depending on the setup and the training needs. And we have so much of online activities and videos that are attributed to our training on our website. Next. ECRAF is actually part of the Global Spectral Lab Network, as alluded earlier, and we are part of GLOSOLAN, uh, Global Soil Laboratory Network under the FAO Global Soil Partnership. And we are regional champion for Sub-Saharan Africa, so we have been investing in that global community and scaling up the technology. Uh, it's a photo that we have on setting up of our new lab in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, that is Cotton and Cashew Nut Board in Sintana Mali. And we were physically doing the training uh, in South Africa under the Soils for Africa project at 
Agricultural Research Center in Pretoria. Those are a few colleagues we've trained, and I know they're also part of this meeting. Next. Yes, we've also been investing in next generation. We understand that these are new technology and new approaches to soil science research. And we have, in 2023, we hosted 14 students. And one of them was actually Soliva, whom you can see on the photo, who was working on uh, developing biochar standards using soil spectroscopy. And then we had a PhD fellow, uh, Edith Chamu, uh, who was based in Australia and worked on uh, effects of planting basins and permeated manure addition on soil carbon and nitrogen pools under on-farm conditions in Makueni. We have hosted a number of students and we continue to do so um, are coming across the globe and East Africa, US, Italy, um, local university, Australian university, and we have huge diverse of students that we host on a day-to-day -day basis, training them up on this new technology, building their capacity, giving them new insight, sharing new knowledge and strengthening their skills on what they need to capture as we move to the next era of spectroscopy and the next generation of it moving towards handheld technology, which we envisage in the near future. Next, thank you. So thank you, Elvis and Dickens. Actually, now I will just give you some brief examples how at c 4 ecraft we use the MIR for various applications. So the first one, like I would like to draw your attention is for the assessing restoration potential in Kenya using spatially explicit maps of soil organic carbon and erosion. So here they use the scientists from the ECRAF, they use an MIR, the MIR database, which at this time consistent for this paper of approximately 4,000 soil MIR uh, spectra with matching reference soil samples from 123 LDSF sites was used to develop the soil property prediction models. And here you can see the predicting the predictions of the spatial distribution and severity of soil erosion in the global tropics using satellite remote sensing. And actually in this paper, they also use the MIR data um, from the soil from the soil spectral lab of C4 ECRAF. And um, in order to make this spatial assessment in order to enable targeting and tracking over time and demonstrate the urgency. And finally, there is also an application that uh, was developed by Dr. Wagen and um, about the global soil erosion application, a combination of earth observation and field data collected using the LDSF, where again, the soil spectroscopy was involved because as I previously mentioned in the LDSF, we analyze using the wet chemistry uh, analysis, only the 10% because the cost will be very high to be analyzed all the soil samples using um, the wet chemistry. So, we reduced a lot the cost. And finally, the key message that we want to share with you today is that c 4 ecraft is a global leader in the assessment and monitoring of soil and land health at scale. We have the tools and methods to measure and track changes in soil and land health at scales relevant to multiple stakeholders, including capturing the complex processes of degradation and restoration, the investments in systematic field data collection, capacity development, database, and data analytics, as you saw, are key. And of course, the use of soil spectroscopy will play a key role in enabling landscape scale assessment. So I would like to thank, to thank all of you for being here today. And again, we would like to thank Dr. Yi Peng and Glossolan for give us the floor and the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, all of you.
Thank you, Zambella, and uh, thanks to the all. Equally, thanks to the Elvis and uh, Dickens. Thanks, thank you very much for a great talk and uh, share your experience from uh, uh, C4E Craft. And uh, I believe uh, all the knowledge and uh, as I think as uh, Elvis, Elvis said, uh, you have been in this business uh, during the last uh, three decades. I think it might be a little bit hard to share all of your knowledge during this uh, one hour time. And um, I believe we will have a more opportunity. We can organize more opportunity, looking for more opportunity to to do this again, and uh, or even arrange the training program as um, you used to do together. All the possibilities. So during your presentation, and uh, I saw some interesting questions, and uh, we can uh, briefly discuss uh, using the rest of the time. But before go to the technical, I think I can answer a couple of general questions. And one of the questions from posed by the Jose, uh, he's asking if uh, we are going to make the slides online. Yes, I think in the beginning of the webinar, I have um, clarified it. I have mentioned that uh, around the one week time after the webinar, we will uh, upload the re recordings and the um, uh, presentation as well. Uh, and also he mentioned about the uh, SOPs, uh, and I believe all the SOPs um, from uh, ECRAF, uh, the lab, such as uh, the um, spectral measurement, et cetera, is also free available online. And uh, Elvis, uh, could you please also share the, the website uh, in, a, in a chat box so the colleagues uh, can find the information about all the SOPs uh, from your website. Um, and also, one of the colleagues asked a question about um, the spectral measurement for the external people. Is it free? <laughs> so, and uh, I, I know it's not really free. So, please, Elvis, also share the, um, the information. I, I, I think there's uh, all the information regarding the analysis and the measurement for both uh, spectral measurement or so the world chemistry analysis. The information from your website. So please share all this information in the chat box so the colleagues so they can they can explore the all the information from your website. And also the websites are on the on the prior presentation. So there are many links in order if someone wants to go and visit our website to be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, Okay, uh, there is, uh, I think I saw, I, I put it, uh, sorry, I just now I put it uh, online. Uh, well, some of the questions I put it to be answered online. Uh, ah, here. I think, ah, there is uh, one question probably for Dickens or for the Elvis. How do you deal with the legal authorization for export or import samples to a uh, craft? Uh, thinking about uh, some of the protocol, for example. I don't know. I, I believe you. I think Elvis, we have talked about this uh, before a long time ago. So I, I believe you have intensive experience about this. And it's always a, it's always a problem because the soil for crossing the border, it's a, it's a big issue. So if you can share some of your uh, experience on that, please. Yeah, um, actually, we as ICRAF are certified and authorized by uh, Kenyan government to import and export soil sample. And that's why we are able and capable of working uh, on soil samples across the globe. Uh, but always, we always say we need to abide with the shared protocol. So if you are shipping in sample, there are laid down procedures that one needs to follow. You need to acquire an export permit. We need to share with you an import permit from Kenya. And then you need to package your sample in a specific way. Of course, for us in Kenya, plastics are banned. So you need to package your sample in a khaki paper bag, triple packed put them in a packaging box or container or, or, or metallic box and uh, label them appropriately and correctly and share all the airway bill number or tracking number with us so we can track the same and uh, cater for the cost of sample shipping if they're emanating from the client. So for our work is just to receive 
and then work on the samples and give you a report. If you declare that your samples need to be returned back, we will organize for the same export exportation, but it probably be under your cost. So it's never that free, but it's it's under a certain cost because of course there are all those logistics and that are need to be taken care of and the shipping protocols that are we need to abide with as, as partner, both clientele and the service providers as a craft. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Elvis. But uh, um, El Elvis and Dickens, uh, could you please also share your um, email address uh, in a chat box uh, in case uh, in case later on their colleagues, they would like to uh, get in contact with you. It doesn't matter for the sample and export import or so it doesn't matter for the data analysis or whatever or the training so they can easily reach you but please uh, when you um send the information in the chat box please select uh, sending the information to the everyone <clears throat> and uh, another question i think uh, it's more related to the limbs so probably it's for the deacons it's the they ask if the limbs, the ecraft limbs, uh, link to the web. Um, if it's, I mean, I guess the question is if this is a online software, and also what about the data privacy? I mean, this is a data privacy can be a question. Answer this question you can write a book. So uh, it's never, it's never an easy question. So please also um, briefly uh, share your your insight about the data privacy, because I saw you mentioned that the um, ECRAF uh, has uh, 150,000 soil sample archives, which means you have a really, uh, a lot of data. <laughs> and uh, also you can uh, share some experience about the, your insight about the data privacy as well, because I believe in many countries, uh, there are many soil samples uh, sent into the ECRAF for the data analysis from uh, all over the world. Thank you, please. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> uh, what happens in LIMS? Yes, it is online, but at the same time, for you to for you to access uh, into LIMS, you need to have a password. It's not just open access to anyone. So let's say, for example, if you want to access LIMS, we need to get your email address and credentials for you to give you permission to be able to access LIMS. And also, when you've accessed limbs or you are, you are inside limbs, the administrator also has got powers to give you access to what you can be able to like uh, see. You cannot see everything. You will only be able to see data that is as pertaining to your data. You cannot see data of you cannot see data for everyone. Yeah, and uh, all these privacy and protocols are supported. We we have a team that uh, looks into that. To, to ensure that uh, our, 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 our site, of course, is like a protected and secured. And at the same time, uh, you cannot just get free access to any data that you need inside the links. Yeah. So those are the, some of the security that we put in place. And because of that, currently what we are doing, uh, we are now trying to develop uh, on limbs the next version because we are foreseeing that different clients outside will also be using the limbs. So uh, our team, what is doing it? What our team is currently doing is trying to like uh, come up with a way in which uh, even if you are given access to limbs, you cannot be able to like uh, get access to the data of different clients. You can only only be able to get data that uh, your data. I cannot explain that technically. For us to explain technically, we need to like uh, bring on board our software engineers team. They are the ones who can like uh, tell you all the facts as to what has been put in place to prevent us from like uh, our data from being infiltrated. Yeah, Elvis. Anything else that I've left out? No, I think it is as you said. Um, yes. As, as it is at the moment, I think it's not publicly available. Uh, it's only for the project partners whom we work with that we give access, and uh, they only access their bits of data sets. And 
Uh, there are all those barriers, but we are working on phase three of this of the lead system where we will customize it for specific clients so uh, and make it more restrictive uh, so uh, and more safer so it's usually a work in progress and of course it's a cloud-based system so um, the only thing that one needs is internet uh, for him or her to access and uh, that will be it but it has backups and offer the same, and it's a very safe and secure system. Thank you. Thank you, both Elvis and uh, DK. I think there is another question. Yeah, I saw uh, Elvis, uh, you are typing. Maybe you can explain a little bit because one, co one colleague is asking, uh, do you have any plan to set up the source spectroscopy lab in, in India? Maybe Elvis, you can briefly explain them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe you have experience to help the different countries and the left to, 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 to establish their spectroscopy lab. And uh, so maybe you can share a little bit of the experience on this and the, how you start to make a collaboration and communication with countries and how to generate ideas, how you find the, the financial resources, so like this. So, then this will give some more ideas to the audience from the different countries so they can actively looking for the financial resources and also the partners. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. So what usually happens is that when we see or we get an inquiry from a client, we normally advise on optimal ways of engagement. And uh, after giving them possibly an overview of what the technology is all about, um, an overview of what is required, the setup, the instrumentation, the anticipated um, systems that are needed. We always also advise on how you can either work with us or work on a proposal or a concept note, seek funds, or else if you have funds already on the ground and you have a, positive, a good donor on the ground or you have good source of funding, then we we engage with you, we work with you, we develop a concept notes that we share with you. This note will cover aspects on that are required on basic aspect on the background information, the instrument setup, the budgeting that would be required as one of them would be the cost of the instrument and uh, needed accessories and equipment, other equipment, then our own costs um, uh, for our own budgeting purposes, because we will need to cover the setup, the capacity building, the training that we always do, and technical backstopping that we always do uh, for a period of either six or 12 months. So we don't just let you begin and start using the machine, but we are always there to provide an end-to-end -end support. So you never at any given time lose track over what you're doing or get stuck. We're always there to support the team. So in a nutshell, that's what we do. So we once we develop the budget, we can work on either developing an MOU or a document as such. And then we sign the agreement. Then we do all the budgetary money, monetary budgetary allocations. And after that, then we start off the work. So it's usually a more systematic and holistic approach that is more custom oriented and more client oriented and focused. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Elvis. And um, I think the ECRAF has some, um, uh, I would like to emphasize again, ECRAF is one of the earliest uh, lab in the world started to working on the source spectroscopy. They really have intensive experience uh, from the sample pre-processing to uh, instrument uh, and measurement measurement protocol, instrument maintenance, data management, uh, and also the final the estimation services, and also including the data archive, et cetera, et cetera. So they really have intensive experience on um, all the aspect related to the show spectroscopy development. So colleagues uh, all over the world, if any of you are interested to work, find opportunity to work with uh, ECRAS, uh, I highly encourage you to, to make this step and uh, Close Along will be happy to facilitate as well. And you also feel free to directly get in contact with the uh, ECRAS colleagues. Uh, I think the, 
I think there is some the, or oh, the last is still have uh, some question how possible is that the reference data for the countries that were involved can be shared for using Ebola? I think the colleague asked about the reference data. So I think you should get in contact with the owners, the 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 the, the, the project or the, the research team who really own this data. I don't think that that is something uh, we can really answer to you now. Um, and the last, um, we just uh, just to let everybody know we shared the website, the ECRAS website in the um, chat box. And uh, you can find all the SOPs and also related to the both wet and dry chemistry analysis information and the contact and also information with them about the ECRAF. Uh, I think I don't see really that many questions uh, left. Oh, just come to another one. Can we have a practical training opportunity at our trust group? Um, before my ECOF colleague is saying about this, and I would like to, um, to, um, to, to explain a little bit on behalf of the glossolan, and as I mentioned in the most beginning, uh, the main objective of the glossolan spec is to, for the capacity development. So we try to do all the possible, try to find all the, all the possibility, possibilities to, to do in a training session. And uh, regarding the practice, practical training opportunity. I think uh, there are various of the training courses uh, conducted conducted regularly in different uh, universities and uh, research institutes. And we also regularly share in this uh, information in our website. So please feel free to uh, follow up in our website. And also please also uh, feel free to, uh, to get in contact with me. And then, so I will uh, put you in a network. Um, uh, so you will be regularly receive this information uh, once we have such uh, activities, especially close to your uh, country. Uh, this is also important. Uh, so uh, in the end, I would like to express my gratitude to all three uh, speakers, uh, Zambela, Iris, and uh, Deacons. Thank you very much again for your uh, kind support and share your experience. I believe uh, your uh, knowledge and experience is really valuable for our community. And uh, we will put these uh, recordings on our website so other colleagues around the world, they can continue watch this uh, video and hopefully in the future we will find a more opportunity to work together and bring this technology to our society thank you very much and we, uh, we will we see you again you. yeah we thank you so much for this great opportunity and we look forward to collaborate more in future thank you yeah. okay See you next time. Thank you everyone for participating. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Okay, bye.